promises. Promises don't seem to mean much anymore. If a politician makes a promise, we don't really focus on that. If a family member makes a promise, depends on the family member. It seems that truth has got more ambiguity these days, and it's hard to trust someone's promise when you don't trust their everyday words. In fact, it seems to me that a promise is no better than the person who makes the promise. But this is where God is different. God is a promise keeper. That's what I want us to talk about today. I'm Dan Sutherland. Welcome to Restore Online. So glad that you are joining us. We're in a series called Discovering God. It was originated by our friend Theo Davis. What I love about this series is it looks at the life of Moses for the first half of his life, for the developmental half, and it shows us how his faith develops, how he discovers God so far. We have talked about God's providence, God's grace, God's availability, God's power. Today, our subject is God's promise. Let's jump right into the story in Exodus 5 and 6. <laughs> All right, Moses, I know you. What's this really about? Ramesses, look, what do you see? A greater Egypt than that of my father. That is not what I see. <laughs> Moses, I cannot change what you see. I have to maintain the ancient traditions. I bear the weight of my father's crown. Do you still not understand what said he was? He was a great leader. His hands bore the blood of thousands of children. <laughs> Slaves. My people, and I can no longer hide in the desert while they suffer at your hands. So, you have returned only to free them. I do not know this God. Neither will I let your people go. Ramesses, please, you must listen. I will not be the weak link. Tell your people, as of today, their workload has been doubled, thanks to your God. Or is it thanks you. I'm reading from the scripture. Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival in my honor in the desert, the wilderness. Is that so? Replied Pharaoh. And who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. That same day, Pharaoh sent this order to the Egyptian slave drivers and the Israelite foremen. Do not supply any more straw for making bricks. Make the people get it themselves. But still require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That's why they're crying out, let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Load them down with more work. Make them sweat. That will teach them to listen to lies. But then the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. 
When he feels the force of my strong hand, he will let the people go. In fact, he will force them to leave the land. I promised to give the land of Canaan where they were living as foreigners. You can be sure that I have heard the groans of the people of Israel who are now slaves to the Egyptians. And I'm well aware of my covenant with them. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and I will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham. Isaac and Jacob, I will give it to you as your very own possession because I am the Lord. From this moment on, God begins to release his fury and do his signs and his wonders that eventually convinces the Pharaoh to let his people go. But I want us to look today at this promise This promise that God made to Moses, this promise that God made to his people. And we're going to look at three promise practices, and then we're going to look at four promises that all of us who follow Jesus can stand on. Here's the first promise practice. Avoid confusing a promise with a principle. Promises are always fulfilled, 100% of the time. Principles are statements of general truth. They're generally going to happen, but not always. There are exceptions. The book of Proverbs is often thought of as a book of promises. It's not. It's a book of principles. It's a book of principles that says, if you do this, this will tend to happen. This will usually happen. An example, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So many parents want that to be a promise. I know I did. And yet we raised our kids the same way and had one that never wandered off the straight path and one that was way off. This is a principle that generally holds true, not a promise that we can claim. We need to know the difference. Don't confuse a promise with a principle. Second promise practice, pay attention to the conditions. Pay attention to the conditions. Many of the promises of God have specific conditions. In other words, they're covenants. It's where one partner, one party says, I'll do this. And the other one says, I'll do that. And they agree together. It's a contract, if you will. We saw this in week one when we looked at the subject of providence. This was the verse. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Now, many of us look at that as a simple promise without conditions. We simply read the first half of the verse. God causes everything to work together for good, period. Bada beam, bada boom. It's not what it says. It says God causes everything to work together for our good if we are loving him and if we are pursuing his purpose. Two conditions that make the promise valid, that make the contract work. We need to do that. There is a third promise practice. Here it is. Avoid choosing promises selectively. Oh, I've been guilty of this. I'll get in a bind and I'll say, God, I'm going to go to the scripture and I'm going to look for a promise that applies to my specific circumstance. And and maybe I'll even bend it a little. Maybe I'll force it to fit. Oh, we got to be careful of choosing promises selectively. Let me give you an example. In the book of Exodus, just a few chapters later from where we read today, in Exodus 14, God tells his people, the Lord will fight for you. You need to only be still. That sounds pretty good to me. I'm not looking for a fight. If God will take it on, I feel pretty good about the outcome. But three chapters later, he tells his people, choose some men to go out and fight. Ah, which one of these is the case? The answer is both. Sometimes when you're in spiritual battle, God tells you to stand still and watch him work. And sometimes when you're in spiritual battle, God tells you, get up and fight. 
We have to follow the Spirit. We have to listen for His voice. If we're just searching for a promise selectively, we can get in trouble. So three promise practices so far. First, avoid confusing a promise with a principle. Secondly, pay attention to the conditions. And thirdly, avoid choosing promises selectively. Those are the practices. But here's the fun stuff. I want to give us four promises we can stand on. Four promises where God says, hey, this is how I want to bless my people. This is how I want to agree with my people. This is the covenant I make with you. You ready? Love the first one. God promises a way out of temptation. He promises a way out. Look at what the scripture says. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Jesus promises a way out of temptation. Again, we have to look for it, but he promises a way out. The second promise that we can stand on, God promises that our salvation is secure. Our salvation is secure. Listen to what he says in John 10. Jesus, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the father's hand. My salvation is secure because no one can take me out of the father's hand. I have seven grandchildren. They all rock. And when they were small and we would go to cross the street when they were one or two years old, I held their hand tightly. Them getting safely across the street had nothing to do with their ability to hang on to me. It had everything to do with my ability to hang on to them. God says, I've got you in my hand and nothing and nobody is going to take you away from me. God promises our salvation is secure. The third promise is that God promises to be with us. Now, if you're like me, there are moments where I say, God, where are you? Where are you? I can't see what you're doing. I can't feel your presence. I'm not hearing your voice right now. I feel like I'm alone. Where are you? But scripture promises he never leaves us or forsakes us. That's the way Jesus says it. Later in the New Testament, it says it this way. I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. God is always there. He's the God who is always present, always with us. And the fourth promise is that God promises to keep working with us, to keep working on us, to keep working in us. I love this verse. It's one of my life verses. One of those verses I claim and cling to in Philippians 1, 6. And I am certain that God who began the good work in you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. God works in us from the minute we say yes to Jesus. He begins working in us and with us and on us. And he's making us more and more like his son. But it's a process and it's a journey. And I still mess up. And I am so glad God's not done with me yet because I am still a work in progress. We quit on God all the time. God never quits on us. Here's a couple of final thoughts for us today. God keeps his promises. He's a promise keeper. Promises are only as good as the person who makes the promise and God's promises are way good. He promises a way out of temptation. He promises our salvation is secure. He promises to be with us and he promises to keep working in us, on us, through us. Here's the question. Which of God's promises do you need to grab onto today? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you are a promise keeper. 
and that we can count on your promises because we can count on your character. We can count on who you are. We can count on you. Help us to practice these promise principles and to cling to these promises and to honor you as your people. It's our prayer in Christ. Amen.